So this is the first in a series of films that I want to make. Uh, the series is called Rethinking Existentialism. Um, I'm writing a book at the moment called Rethinking Existentialism. And the idea is that each of these films will introduce uh, the basic ideas of each of the chapters of the book uh, as I write the book. So each film will only be about 10, maybe 15 minutes long. Um, and uh, is it really intended as a kind of bite-sized introduction to the chapter and together they'll make a, a good introduction to the book. Um, the book itself is focused on French existentialism, what I consider to be the, the, um, the core of classical existentialism. The works uh, in the 1940s and early 1950s of Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre uh, and to some extent Franz Fanon. Um, but the book will also kind of set their thought in its context uh, by considering the relationships between what they have to say and the works of Albert Camus and uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty uh, and uh, slightly earlier works of uh, Sigmund Freud. So as this is the first film um, and the first chapter of the book, the obvious question to ask is what is existentialism? And so that's the title of this film and it's the title of the chapter too. Um, so yeah, what is existentialism? That's a very good question. I'm glad I asked that question because if you pick up um, uh, an introductory book or an introductory article or an encyclopedia article or something like that about existentialism, you might find frustratingly that it doesn't answer that question. Um, it's quite common for introductory works on existentialism to just list a bunch of thinkers. They say, oh, it's the, you know, it's the works of Kierkegaard and maybe Nietzsche, maybe Heidegger, Sartre, Beauvoir, um, maybe Camus, uh, and, and maybe to pick out a bunch of issues that they all uh, discussed, um, such as freedom or the significance of, of death and mortality or uh, the origins of uh, moral values or something like that. Um, and it can be very hard to see what makes these people existentialists and what makes those um, theories, existentialist theories that, that are discussed in these works. Um, it, it, it comes to look rather like a kind of rag bag of uh, closely related thoughts um, by thinkers who influenced one another uh, but, but with no clear sense of unity, no clear sense of why um, those people and those thoughts are being categorised together in this way. And as a result, no clear definition of what existentialism really is. Um, now, I think that this has, this has happened for historical reasons. Um, for a long time uh, in, uh, in the 20th century, in the, in the second half of the 20th century, in um, English speaking universities in the USA and, and North America more generally and, and in the UK, um, it was really taboo to talk about European philosophy. Um, it was considered not really to be philosophy, not to be uh, well thought out, rigorous, well argued, well considered um, work. And so it's in that context that people like Robert Solomon and Walter Kaufman um, wrote introductions to uh, uh, what they called existentialism, which covered over a wide range of, of European uh, thinkers, novelists, um, playwrights, as well as and poets, as well as uh, philosophers. Um, and both Kaufman and uh, Solomon edited um, anthologies uh, of extracts from the works of the people that they were discussing in their introductory books. Um, and this is what formed the kind of core curriculum under the name of existentialism uh, uh, for, for thousands and thousands of students for years on end. Um, and this, as I say, was just a way of, of getting this literature discussed in university departments, in philosophy departments, uh, uh, where it was considered uh, not to be very good philosophy. Um, <clears throat> and it's on the basis of, of those kind of collections of of, of extracts that people come to look at 
existentialism and try and define what it is and, and can't see much in common between all these people that have been categorized together in this way um, and as a result tend to despair of ever giving a definition of existentialism even um, sometimes uh, telling you that the, the idea of defining existentialism is itself anathema to existentialism right there's something unexistentialist about the idea that you could even define what it is to make uh, that makes something uh, an existentialist theory um, I think this is a mistake I, I think this is this is a, a, an accident of history an accident of um, the politics of of, uh, of academia in the English-speaking world in the second half of the 20th century um, I think that Solomon and Kaufman have done us a great service in, uh, in um, uh, uh, bringing that European literature uh, uh, into the curriculum despite the opposition that they faced in doing so but one of the side effects of the way they did it and they used the word existentialism because it had such an appeal um, uh, to students um, but one of the side effects of doing it is that um, we've kind of lost sight of what really is or ever was the, the core of existentialism, I think. And so that's one of the things I want to rethink um, in this book. Because I think that actually the word is unusual in the history of philosophy in that it gets a clear definition um, pretty much as soon as it's even coined as a word. Right. Um, so the word was coined sometime probably around 1942, 1943, uh, it seems. Um, and it was used um, to label uh, a kind of movement among philosophers who would talk about human existence in a certain kind of a way, uh, who would use the word existential in a certain kind of way. And they would use that word to mean um, to refer to. The, the kind of existence that human beings have, the kind of way that we are, the kind of way that we live. And that's different from the kind of existence, as we would ordinarily use the word in English, the kind of existence of chairs and tables and rocks and planets and plants and rainbows and cats and dogs. Those all uh, don't exist in this technical sense of the word, they just are. Um, this is a word, the use of the word existence, um, which uh, really traces back to Martin Heidegger. Um, <coughs> uh, in in his book Being and Time uh, in 1927 and began to influence French and German thought um, quite rapidly across the 1930s. Um, but it gets its clear definition in 1945. Um, what happens in 1945 at the end of the Second World War is that uh, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre decide to take on the word existentialism and use it as a kind of, basically as a kind of brand name for their philosophy. Um, and so uh, they quite deliberately um, go on what Beauvoir uh, describes in her autobiography as the existentialist offensive. They publish um, lots of articles um, uh, and other works they give public lectures uh, and they keep using the word existentialism and defining it and, and, and uh, giving it um, uh, a precise meaning, which is the meaning of, of their own philosophy. And so for this reason, I want, to, uh, I want to say that that's where we should start when we rethink existentialism. We should start with the idea that existentialism is as it was defined to be by the people who first gave it a clear definition. Um, it is what Sartre and Beauvoir uh, said it was in 1945 during the existentialist offensive. Now this is slightly complicated by the fact that they didn't actually quite agree with each other. So they both used the same language, they used the same phrase in fact, and the key phrase here is the phrase uh, existence precedes essence. Right, that's uh, how Sartre defines it in his lecture, Existentialism is a Humanism, uh, which was delivered in October 1945 and was subsequently published um, as, a, as a little book uh, and has become uh, very, very widely read all over the world ever since. It's also how uh, Simone de Beauvoir defines it in her essay, uh, Existentialism and Popular Wisdom, which was published in uh, October or November, I'm not sure, 1945, in uh, Les Tontes Modernes. 
at modern times, which was a, a, a journal, a kind of literary and cultural review that Sartre and Beauvoir, uh, with uh, other people, including uh, Melo Ponti, um, uh, set up uh, in 1945 as part of the existentialist offensive. So they both define existentialism in that way. Existence precedes essence. But they disagree on exactly what that means. And so one part of the book, uh, one theme through my book, is going to be tracing exactly what that disagreement is uh, and um, how the disagreement gets resolved between them. But before I talk about that, um, uh, I'll say a bit more about what they mean by the, what, what, what they both mean by the phrase that existence precedes essence. Um, and this, I guess, is slightly um, unclear because the word essence uh, can mean different things. So in the way in which they're using the term, um, I think uh, what they mean is what Aristotle meant um, uh, when he talked about the essence of particular individuals. So the essence of an object or a thing um, uh, in this Aristotelian sense is the um, principle of organisation right, that explains why it does what it does. Okay, so it's what it is that, that, that explains how the object kind of has the effects that it has in the world um, uh, by uh, explaining how its various parts are organised and why its various parts are organised together in the way that they are. So as an example, the, uh, you might think that the essence of a house, in this sense of essence, is that it's a shelter for living in, right? And because it's a shelter for living in, well, it has parts like walls and a roof and places to sleep and places to cook uh, and places to eat. Um, and that these are all organised in such a way as to keep the rain out and the wind out and to keep it as warm as possible and so on. And why? Why does it do all those things? Why does it have its various parts that it has that are organised in that way so that it serves that purpose? Well, because it's a shelter for living in. That's why. That's the essence of a house. Um, so in their view that for human beings, existence precedes essence, what Beauvoir and Sartre are trying to say is that they think that for the individual human being, there is no single organising principle that explains why they behave the way they do, why they organise themselves and their lives the way that they do. Okay, so there is no inbuilt character, there's no personality, they think, to an individual that's just innate uh, and just develops from birth according to causal interactions with the world. Um, and similarly, for that reason, they think there are no collective characteristics um, either, because if there's no innate characteristics of an individual, then there can't be any innate characteristics of a particular group of individuals. So there's no um, innate essential characteristics of gender, for example. There are no essential characteristics that mark out um, men and women as different. And similarly, there are no essential characteristics of different ethnic groups. Right? Different uh, people from, from different ethnic backgrounds are not essentially different uh, on the existentialist picture because they can't be, because nobody has any inbuilt essential properties. Um, instead, on their view, what makes uh, the, uh, each individual behave the way they do um, is a set of projects. That's their word for it. Um, a set of projects that the individual is pursuing. And what that really comes down to, I think, uh, is a set of values. A set of values that the individual endorses and uh, uh, pursues in action. Okay, so that's, I mean, we're going to explore this uh, idea in a lot more detail across the rest of the films. So I realise it's a bit sketchy right there, uh, but that's the basic idea that the, the reason that it, it, one way of thinking of it is this, that the, that the character that an individual person has, that you have, is not um, something you're born with or something that, uh, that you, as it were, can't help, um, but it really comes down to a set of values uh, that organise and shape the way you see the world and that they are your values and that you can change those values. That's the idea. It's a pretty controversial idea and there's an important question of how far, how far it goes. Um, 
But that is the basic idea of existentialism. Now, two more points. One is that, um, as I say, Sartre and Beauvoir disagree on exactly what that means um, in 1945. By 1952, I think they agree. And what's happened uh, over that time is that Sartre has come around to Beauvoir's way of thinking. So in 1945, um, Beauvoir's view, or Beauvoir's view all along, I think, is that the values that, and the projects that you pursue become, become habituated. They become, um, to use Merleau-Ponty's word, sedimented. That is, the, the influence that they have over your behavior becomes stronger and more difficult to overcome as time goes on. The more uh, you act on a particular value, the more you act on uh, uh, a way of seeing the world, the more it just becomes deeply ingrained in your in your outlook. Um, and that's not to say for Beauvoir that it can't be overcome, but to say that it can't simply be abandoned. You can't just change your mind uh, and, and stop seeing the world the way you have done for years and years on end, right? Um, Sartre, on the other hand, thinks that you can. On Sartre's picture in 1945, or in fact in 1943, in, in Being and Nothingness, um, that's exactly what you can do. That's exactly the idea. Um, and that's what he calls radical freedom, that you can just overthrow at any time any aspect of, uh, of your worldview, uh, no matter how long it, it, it's been something that you, you know, has been uh, defining who you are. Um, he thinks that you don't, people don't do that, uh, and he thinks they don't do that because it, it comes at a heavy price. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do, to persuade yourself to do, um, but, but there's no kind of inbuilt structure of human existence that actually makes it difficult. Right? There's nothing that, there's, there's no way in which uh, those values have become embedded for Sartre in 1945. By 1952, I think he's changed his mind and is seeing the, way, the world the way Beauvoir does. Um, but that's something um, I'll talk about more in, uh, in this series of films. Um, and the second point is um, that existentialism isn't only a theory of behaviour and motivation. It isn't only a theory of what it is to be human. Um, it's also an ethical theory. In fact, it's their concern, uh, you know, in many ways, both ones are very traditional Socratic philosophers. They think that um, the fundamental question of philosophy is how one should live, right? It's how to live. Um, and that's the question of ethics. Uh, and so because they think that that's the basic question um, of philosophy, uh, but they also stand in, in a, in a very uh, uh, long-standing philosophical tradition of thinking that the way to answer that question is through a concern with what human existence is. So how can you answer the question of how should we live? Well, first you need to understand what our kind of life is, right, before you can see what a good way to live is. And that's why they develop the, the particular theory of um, human motivation that they do, the theory that existence precedes essence. They want to uh, use that as the basis of their ethics. In fact, they, that's exactly what they try to do. Um, so later on in this series of talks, I'm going to talk about that, about uh, the problems for, for their ethical outlook that are actually generated by their particular view of human existence um, and about the ways in which they try to overcome those problems. Um, and to give you a sneak preview, what I'm going to say is uh, Sartre doesn't succeed in his attempt um, to overcome those problems, I think. Uh, but Beauvoir's argument um, that's first published actually in 1944 in her short book Pyrrhus and Sinius um, is uh, much more promising in that regard and situates existentialism in, the, in a tradition of, of Kantian ethics. Um, so it turns out that... Um, the view that she's arguing for there uh, is very similar to something that uh, uh, Immanuel Kant makes uh, central to morality in his um, groundwork uh, for the metaphysics of morals. But all of that is to come uh, in later films. I hope uh, this short introduction to the series has been uh, useful and uh, goodbye. <laughs>